Hi, this is Catherine, and this is Taking Tea with Catherine, and this is Tea and Mystery for May and June. There's only really two books, so I haven't been reading a lot of mysteries lately. There will also be a little bit of history, which I always like anyway. So today I have some Victorian London Fog from Hardy and Sons, which I am trying for the first time with some oat milk. Uh, it's not made into a latte, it's just in there so I don't know if it's gonna be that good it probably won't be my best cup of tea but one of the books I'm going to talk to you about today is not my favorite of the author so maybe that kind of balances out I don't know if however the other book was to be featured in this pairing I would have chosen Prince of Wales tea by Twinings but the problem is I don't have any Prince of Wales tea just can't seem to find it as easily in stores as I used to. It used to be that you could at least find it in that Twinings multi-pack of black teas and it would have like an Earl Grey, Lady Grey, Prince of Wales, I don't know. But now they seem to have taken the Prince of Wales out for whatever reason. And so we're not using that today, but FYI would be a good pairing. But let's talk about um, first the book I read in May, the very end of May actually. So this is uh, The Mystery of the Blue Train by Agatha Christie. <sighs> the other train mystery. I'm not saying that there was no other books of hers that took place on trains. I'm pretty sure there were some. But this is her first and not her best. Um, you know, uh, Murder on the Orient Express is just such a classic. And I don't even think it's my favorite of her, of her um, mysteries. But... But it's much more satisfying, I think. And she just it feels like she put more thought into it. I am not criticizing this as a bad book. I would say, however, if this was my first entry-level Agatha Christie book, I may not have continued. Um, it, it was written not long after the whole, her own specific mystery in her life, where she was going through um, a time where her husband was divorcing her, and she disappeared for a few days. No one knew where she was. Other writers, um, mystery writers, were enlisted to help out to see if they could figure out where she went, like Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, for goodness sakes, and I think Dorothy Sayers, maybe. And then she just turned up, and no one really knows, although there's been so many theories and dramatizations of what could have happened to her. So maybe she was still in a bit of a not best frame of mind. I'm not saying that she was, it, it was horrible, but okay, so I'm going to stop saying that I, that it wasn't my favorite and just say a little bit about the story. And basically there is a, a jewel called the, I think it's a ruby, Heart of Fire, which you could say sounds a little bit like Heart of the Ocean from Titanic, but even though Titanic happened in 1912, and the story was a bit later, we know that the actual Heart of the Ocean was fictional and written, or at least that I know of, <laughs> and that the movie that, that, that had that diamond was in 1997. So sometimes it's hard to separate reality. <laughs> I don't know why, but um, with fiction. But so there's this ruby and it, there's this whole intrigue early in the story um, involving this very rich American man um, who, um, gets a hold of this and has to keep hold of it because there's people after him and there's like Russian spies and other really, again, caricature-ish characters that just so, um, I don't want to say, it's just like just narrow portrayals of people according to their culture background, etc. So I know, you know, Sometimes people in past times would write that way, but I felt like this book, she really excelled at that, where it was like, all right, this is a bit of a cartoon. So anyway, this man um, gifts this um, jewel to, her, to his daughter, who is having marital problems. Her husband, Derek Kettering, is just a bit of a flanderer, a lot of different things, um, is involved with this woman who's also a very over dramatized person um and so ruth kettering the daughter um it go is going off on a train to the um i think it's the french riviera and she gets 
murdered, the jewels get stolen. <laughs> and that's basically, you know, who done it because um Derek Herring ends up being on the train. So it would seem, according to the circumstances, that he would be the most likely sub suspect. But there are other people on the train that also could have been suspect. Suspect. And um, so there's just a bunch of intrigue and up and down and, and mistaken identities and, uh, and disguises and that kind of thing. A little bit of cross-dressing thrown in for good measure. And um, then there's a character called Catherine Gray, which... I'm not going to go into the whole historical figure named Catherine Gray from Tudor times. I was tempted to, but then I realized why. Uh, she's a woman, I think, in her 30s who's lived basically a life of working for other people, like almost like in service. She was Her last job was a lady's companion. And this lady dies and leaves her a pretty good fortune. So now she's gone from being in this kind of servant-ish role um to a different lifestyle altogether so she decides to also take a trip and she ends up being on this train and then there's relatives of hers who seem a bit you know grasping and who knows what's behind that um i liked her character for the most part they're um what i kind of liked more than anything and i don't know if this was something that agatha christie had in mind but she had catherine gray coming from um it's called St. Mary Mead, I think is the name of the town, the village, which is what, uh, bef this is before Miss Marple was introduced. And this is where Miss Marple, I, I don't know if this was intended, but this is where Miss Marple was from. So, um, that's kind of just, I don't know, it just put a, a, a nice sort of homey feeling. And when I saw the adaptation, I, I think they pretty much left that whole part out. And again, adaptations, I'm talking about the Poirot, um, that had David Suchet, who I love, um, who I think is the best Poirot, but the adaptations are good, but always deviate in some way from the actual story, sometimes dramatically so, and sometimes just a little bit. Um, so it had a basically um, satisfying ending, slightly surprising, I think. Um, I, you know, I, I had a basic idea, but then I had forgotten because I haven't watched the adaptation in a while. So I wasn't exactly sure who did it. And because people were changed around so much, I really wasn't entirely sure. Um, so I did, I didn't mind, I didn't mind the story. It was, it was good. It wasn't great either. Um, one thing I didn't quite like, and I don't think this was mentioned in the adaptation, which is probably one of the best things that was left out. Sometimes there are things that are best left out. And at one point, Catherine Gray, after the murder, seems to hear the murdered, the victim, tell her something about who did it, who done it from beyond the grave. And I, that's just not necessary. I mean, especially because Poirot, not that he's a completely just all logic, all method, but he, you know, he's a pretty rational person. And I, you know, it just didn't need to get in there. I mean, even Sherlock Holmes didn't have that too much. And we know that Arthur Conan Doyle was involved with all kinds of stuff, maybe a little bit later, but still. So I think it was what I would call, if you're going to read the Poirot books in order, I would say, yeah, do read this, but and it's not terrible. I just, I don't know. It was more of a three star to me. And I'm just a little disappointed because I, I know that this was the book that I was going to read. By the way, this tea's not bad. Uh, um, this is the one that I was going to read and then take myself on a little bit of a hiatus from Agatha Christie. Not for very long, maybe a month or so. Mainly because next month, um, Jane Austen July, if I'm going to read anything not related to Jane Austen, it's not going to be an Agatha Christie. Um, I'll probably pick up something in August, but I just, I would have liked to have gone out on a high note rather than a, yeah, okay. <laughs> so I don't know what this tells you, if, 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 it, if it's warned you off of it or not, but just like, it is really like, um, for one of Agatha Christie's stories, it's like someone who is... Don't take offense if you're a vegetarian, please. But like if you are trying to get off meat and you really enjoy your meat eater, you know, you've had some really good barbecue and and you have substitute meat 
and I've had some really good substitute meat. Um, like, that sounds weird. But, um, you know what I'm talking about, like, fake chicken, fake whatever. I had a fake chicken parmesan that was actually really good one time. But you know, most of the time, even if it's good, it's never quite what actual flesh <laughs> would taste like. So, you know, you're like, okay, all right. But at least if you're vegetarian, you're usually doing it for dietary needs or for, you know, because you don't like what happens to animals in order to make your meal. In this case, it's just a book. So I'm like, do I really need this not, not best Agatha Christie book? It's not, it, it's not even her worst one, I don't think, but it's just not my favorite. And um, again, maybe your opinion is completely different than mine, but I have not, I just was not impressed very much. Not that I could do better, <laughs> but I would say unless you're a completist, you don't need this book or it's unless you just want something that's a little bit of an escape. It's not bad for that. So anyway, moving on quite, quite actually moving back in time. Um, I read the first of Peter Lovesy's Birdie, the complete Prince of Wales mysteries. I read uh, Birdie and the Tin Man, which is the initial one. And it was interesting because I've never that I know of, unless I'm forgetting completely, but I don't recall ever reading anything from Peter Lovesy. And he has a lot of work behind him that I've just never really was aware of. I, I think Sergeant Cribb is like his Victorian detective and I had some kind of vague knowledge of that, maybe in some weird... I think it's because that was one of the kickoff mysteries on the show, Mystery, which is now Masterpiece Mystery, which was um, a program that came on public television in the United States, maybe Canada too, I'm not sure, but definitely the United States, that yeah, you because know, they had already had Masterpiece Theater, which was just mostly classics, that sort of thing that, you know, dramatized for television, sometimes made for the show and often not. Sometimes just dramatizations that they used to present on the show, which was good because it exposed people to things that they may not have known about. And so this was the mystery version of it. And that's fantastic. I mean, if they didn't have this this program, I would have never, I don't think have gotten into Sherlock Holmes as quickly as I did because Jeremy Brett, have I mentioned how much I love Jeremy Brett? And later there was Miss Marple programs and um, Morse and now Endeavor and Poirot. I mean, <sighs> embarrassment of riches. So, and some other ones that were kind of tepid, but that's, we're not going to talk about that. Um, but I just didn't know about him or I just didn't really... I, I like mystery a lot, you know, but I don't think I'm the top expert on it. And that's good because that gives me something to keep exploring. Um, but this is, I think it's like three parters. So I, I read the first one. And when I say three parters, it's three novels. Um, where Bertie, who is the Prince of Wales, who became Edward the Seventh, um, was, you know, I, it's funny because now we have a Prince of Wales we, when I say we, the United Kingdom, but you know, in existence, there was a Prince of Wales who has been so for a very long time. He, I think he got invested or whatever the word is officially in like the late sixties. But I mean, he's been basically when you were uh, next in line for the throne, you're basically, and you're a male, you are the Prince of Wales until, <laughs> until your parent dies, which is not not exactly a great thing because you'll never really come into your own until your parent dies. And I know they talk about the tensions that happen between families when in that case. It didn't seem to exist between um, Elizabeth, uh, Queen Elizabeth II and her father, um, George VI, um, who was also known as Bertie in, in real life. But um, I think they had just such a different dynamic, different relationship. And, and he did actually die kind of young. So she became queen young. So maybe they just, maybe he just didn't live long enough for that relationship to turn that way. I'm thinking that really, if he would have lived as long as his brother did into the seventies, I think they probably still would have had a good relationship. That's besides the point. Um, but you know, I, I watched the Victoria program, which is also on masterpiece. <laughs> um, and which is, you know, mostly based on her life, occasionally a little bit over dramatized. But um, in what, what we've been left with 
on the program, which I don't know when they're going to start making new episodes, who knows, but um, Birdie is a young boy with some learning issues. I, they say he might have been dyslexic, I'm not sure. Um, and he seems to relate more to his mother than his father. His father seems to put a lot of pressure on him. So when you get into this story, you feel a little bit like how is, how is he so distant with his mother? She does, Queen Victoria, does make an appearance in this book, and it's kind of a funny scene in a weird way. Um, you know, how does it go from there to there? But there was a thing that happened in his younger life when he was, I guess, I don't know if it was late teens, early 20s. I can't remember the exact time. I mean, I remember exactly when it happened, but I just don't feel like doing math. Um, where he sort of, you know, was a, was a kind of a party guy. I guess when we say party guy it was a little different back then, but you know, he, he was a young guy and he was, you know, he had, you know, involvements with different women and everything, even though he apparently had a pretty happy marriage. But before that, you know, he, he just was a bit of a, you know, he had money, people were thrown at him, that kind of, that kind of person, not excusing him, just saying this is how he was. And, uh, not an evil guy, but not, you know, so anyway, he had gotten some kind of scandal that I don't even know if it was his fault or not, but it was a little bit of a scandal. And with, I think, an actress or somebody and or a dancer, who knows. And his father, Prince Albert, went to see him. I think it was during like a cold time period. And um, Albert was already not feeling well. And he went to see him and to straighten things out. And around that time, Albert really got sicker and sicker and ended up dying so it seems that queen victoria associated albert's death with Bertie and his way of life and possibly blamed him a little bit for his father's death so that did not contribute to a great relationship and then put that on top of the fact that this is the guy who will take over once you die it's not you know at this point where the story begins, <laughs> you know, I'm going into history, but I told you we're going to talk about history a little bit. Um, it was, it, uh, it starts in November 8th, 1886. And a famous, very well-known popular jockey whose name is escaping me, so I think I'm going to look up, I think his name is Fred Archer, kills himself. And this really happened. Um, at this point, Bertie was approximately in his mid-40s. So he had already had his own children, you know, his own, you know, obviously his own marriage. A lot of his scandalous times were behind him, but he, you know, he was still associated with a lot of people who were living the kind of Edwardian life before it became the actual Edwardian period. Um, and so Bertie and the, um, he kind of gets involved in trying to figure out why this man killed himself he was very successful extremely successful okay he was a little taller than a lot of jockeys so he had to um maybe diet more so that may have done something to his mental health a little bit and they say he might have had typhoid which Bertie is quite the expert on but he has his doubts now in real life we don't think that the prince of wales actually got involved in solving any mysteries but in this case they kind of just insert him in so it kind of makes it kind of makes um Kind of makes it into a historical novel in a way because it takes an actual event and puts someone in the middle of it so he goes kind of like him being who he is kind of helps him because he can get into places that nobody else can he has influence over people that no one else can have besides his mother maybe but he also it also kind of he also has to be incognito in so many ways and sneak around because he can't have been seen at certain places when he investigates. He goes to places that you would never go to. And this is 1886. There's a part where he goes to like the East End, which is shortly when Jack the Ripper is going to start his nonsense. So, um, so all of that, you, you would not have wanted to be seen <laughs> as the Prince of Wales in those areas. So, so it's a little bit of both and he has some people who help him out and then you know some people get put in certain dangerous circumstances and you know he has some hunches he's not really the best detective he just seems to fall into things but he does have a he doesn't have he's not a complete idiot too he's like kind of a mixture between Sherlock Holmes and Watson like the Watson who's the more blundery Watson I mean um that you know that was invented kind of more later um but he but it it's funny because he kind of 
has a way of justifying himself and making himself seem a little more cool than he really is. So that is is a little fun. Um, but it also comes off of how he was treated all this time. So it is entertaining. Not as entertaining as I would have liked for myself personally, not for not for the reader in general, because I'm not into racing, horse racing or anything. I'm not interested in jockeys. Like, um, there was a Sherlock Holmes mystery called, I think, Silver Blaze, where there's something to do with a missing horse. And it was okay. Uh, but I just, that's just not my cup of tea, as I always say. So that sometimes would make me kind of fade out a little bit when they get too much into that. But otherwise, just the interactions with history and that time period and, and just the, the, some, the adventures that he gets into are was good enough that I want to keep going in this book. And there's two more mysteries um, to go through. Another thing I think they did, um, Peter Lovesy did just for fun, was at one point where he goes, um, where he goes to investigate something, uh, you know, quietly, he wears an outfit that is very much like the deer stalker hat and, and Kate kind of um, look, I think, to tone himself down. And this is just like right before the first Sherlock Holmes came out. So I think, you know, it's kind of like a, almost like making him seem like he was the early Sherlock Holmes, which obviously he wasn't, but you know, it's not a, actually, it's not a very big part of the plot, but I just, I think that was done on purpose and I could be wrong, but whatever. Um, and I just love this actual book. I've said this so many times. I just love the way it looks. However, when I read it, because I just don't like the flaps, I ended up reading it like this, but it still had this lovely picture of Soho crime. So I would recommend it. I actually would recommend that more than the blue train, Mr. The Blue Train. Even though this was, again, I just, I, it's so hard for me to talk badly about an Agatha Christie, but um, it just was not her top form. And and from what I hear, Peter Lovesy's written better books than the Birdie Mysteries. So I have a feast in store for me. So many books, so little time. So that was Tea and Mystery with a side of history. I hope you've enjoyed. Let me know if you read these. Um, or if you want to read these, hope I haven't spoiled anything. I don't think I did. Um, and let me know um, which um, Peter Lovesy I should get to next. Is it the, the Cribs or is it something else that I should read? And let me know if you've had some really disappointing uh, book from a writer that you really love. So this is Catherine, taking tea with Catherine. Have a lovely tea and mystery filled day. Bye-bye.